And I think we will get started. I want to welcome everyone. My name is Judy Mergles. I'm the director at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I want to thank you for joining us today for this program, Interrupting Violence from the Holocaust to Modern Hate Groups. I'm especially pleased to welcome our panelists, Dr. Barry Slutkin, Daryl Davis, Ryan Loray, and, and moderator Randall Blazak. I also want to thank World Oregon, our co-sponsor for the program. Amber Kirsten from the museum staff also deserves a shout out for handling the tech for today's program. April is Holocaust uh, is Genocide Awareness Month, and we've just been bursting with events at the museum and with our partners. The next program in this series takes place next Friday, April 21st, Tools of Survival, Tribal Education, Relationships and Sovereignty in Oregon Tribes. And it's going to be with Lisa Watt and Brent Spencer. The series culminates the following week with Yom HaShoah, the annual service in remembrance of the Holocaust. On Wednesday, April 27th at 7 p.m., we're gonna be at Congregation Beth Israel, followed by the reading of the names on April 28th, where we're gonna spend the day in Pioneer Courthouse Square, reading aloud the names of those murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators. Everyone is most welcome to join us for both events and you can find details on our website. Included in our museum's mission, the mission of the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education is a challenge to resist indifference and discrimination and to envision a just and inclusive world. This imperatively drives us to teach our audiences that we have a responsibility to one another and that apathy, passivity, and inaction to injustice can result in public disaster. One of the ways that we fulfill these pursuits is through programs like this that allow us to look intently at some of the unrelenting problems facing us today, that we can be in partnership with colleagues and organizations that share our goals makes our work that much more rewarding. World Oregon, with its mission to keep Oregonians connected to people, places, and ideas that are shaping our shared global future, is one of our favorite partners to work with. I'm always grateful to be working with my friend and colleague, Tim DeRoche, their director of programs. You'll meet Tim at the end of this program. He'll come and close us out. Today's program gives us a unique opportunity to see how public health models can interrupt and stop the spread of violence, and in particular, extremist violence. Cure Violence, as you're soon gonna learn more about, asserts that violence is a learned behavior and that it can be prevented using disease control methods. I'm now pleased to introduce Randall Blazak and welcome our three experts who will discuss this approach and how it is being applied to violence in Oregon. Randall Blazak is a regular commentator on NPR, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, just to name a few, where he generously shares his deep expertise on hate crimes and hate groups. Randall earned his PhD at Emory University after completing an extensive field study of racist skinheads that included undercover observations and interviews across the world. He became a tenured sociology professor at Portland State University. Currently, he teaches sociology at the University of Oregon. His work has taken him from classrooms to criminal trials. His research has been published in academic journals, books, and in the mainstream press. He is the co-author of Teenage Renegades, Suburban Outlaws, and editor of Hate Offenders. Randall regularly speaks at conferences, consults on criminal cases, and leads workshops on the topics of hate and bias. And for the past 20 years, he's been the chair of the Coalition Against Hate Crimes. Currently, he is the vice chair of the steering committee in charge of implementing Oregon's new bias crime law. We want your questions. Please be sure to put them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. We're just asked that you don't put them in the chat. Um, Q&A is where they should go. Thank you. And without further ado, Randall, welcome. And thank you all. I appreciate all that. And thank you, uh, especially to the Oregon Jewish Museum and World Oregon for helping to organize this really important event. And the fact that it's on this day, on Good Friday, on a day when Christians think about forgiveness and the beginning of Passover, when we mark the the movement from slavery, the, the chains of slavery to freedom. This is a, a really wonderful opportunity to be able to have this important conversation. I wanted to take a little bit of time before I introduce our panelists to talk a, a kind of a, a little bit about the project that brings them, brings everyone together on this day, as well as some of my recent experience that informs this. Um, there is a 
as we'll learn, uh, uh, a kind of a different way of approaching the notion of extremist violence. I mean, the, the classic way has just been going after the bad guys, locking them up, shutting them down, trying to act as a deterrent to prevent other bad guys from doing bad things. But we are now looking at a more uh, holistic medical model of the spread of violence. And we're, we're sort of joined together working on a project that is looking at how to address the issue of extremist violence. And you may have seen recently uh, uh, an audit came out from the Oregon Secretary of State uh, that looked at the deep problem of extremist violence in the state of Oregon. Oregon is ranked sixth in the country in terms of the number of ex extremist events between 2011 and 2020. Much of that was in the year 2020. Uh, number five is Washington. So the Pacific Northwest certainly has a history of that. So we're really working on finding a ways of interrupting violence, not interrupting radicalism, I'm arguing that radicalism is in of itself isn't a bad thing as a sociology professor, uh, but when that spills over into violence, and we've certainly seen our share of violence in the Pacific Northwest in the last few years, especially in the Portland metro area. So we are joined together on this project and we've been doing work over the past year uh, to partner with community members and what would best serve the community in interrupting the escalation to violence. My background in this has been on sort of right-wing extremism, but I'm just returning from um, two weeks in Poland and Ukraine where I have seen the, the escalation of hate, the escalation of misinformation. And one of the things that connects uh, what's happening on the other side of the planet right now with what we're talking about today, of course, is the word genocide. The word genocide has been used, including by President Biden to describe what's happening in Ukraine, but also the flow of bad information. We've seen so much misinformation going out uh, to inflame people to engage in violence, to take their political beliefs and turn them into, into pretty, um, pretty horrific violence as we've been seeing coming out of Ukraine. And what I saw while I was there, part of my work was bringing um, bring supplies in, but also ferrying refugees out across the border, going into Lviv, for example, and bringing uh, families out, is the incredible trauma that is experienced because of hatred and violence. And that trauma can be long lasting. The face on the children that I interacted with uh, was heartbreaking. Uh, those kids will carry the scars of this war with them through their lives and need a lot of healing. So the, the positive side of that is what we're going to talk about today is how we can interrupt uh, that movement towards violence. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists in a moment, and we've reserved a good uh, 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. But the, the orienting question I'm going to ask our panelists is, based on your experience in your particular field, what have we learned that can prevent future Holocaust, future acts of genocide, whether they're localized or they're of the grand scale that we saw uh, 80 years ago. My last day in Poland was spent at Auschwitz. Uh, that is a day that will forever transform me. When you're standing there under the gates that say work shall make you free and you realize how real that place was and it's right next to um, the larger Auschwitz II camp, uh, Birkenau, which was essentially just a killing camp uh, where people were divided between the people who would be working and the people who would be exterminated, you see how, how that actually unfold, unfolded in, in, in the modern world. And it just dedicates you to trying to prevent that from happening again. So our sort of focus is how, how are these lessons that we're learning about interrupting extremist violence useful in preventing those large levels of violence in our community? So having said that, that's just a, a, little, a little attempt for me to sort of introduce what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we've, we've requested about 10 minutes from each of our speakers. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them. So that will give us time for Q&A. We've got a little Q&A button uh, on your Zoom panel. If you've got questions, and I'll be monitoring the questions, and we will come back to those questions at the end of each of our presenters. So let me give a, a very brief introduction so we can give them the lion's share of their time. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Gary Slutkin. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Cure Violence Global, the organization that we've been working with around the issue of this 
sort of medical model, this public health model of violence. Gary is a physician and epidemiologist who's led efforts to combat epidemics of tuberculosis, cholera, and AIDS. He's worked in over 25 countries in East and Central Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and consulted on SARS and Ebola viruses. He was the director of intervention for the World Health Organization and is currently tracking and advising governments on COVID-19. He will speak first. Our second speaker is Ryan Olori, who works with us on our team on this project. He is the on the executive board of Parallel Networks and an interventionist and program specialist and helps produce the counter narrative content that Parallel Networks works on to bring people out of extremism. And, and he'll be speaking on that. Ryan was once a right wing extremist with the Rolling Wood Skins, probably one of the people I studied <laughs> in my past research, uh, Michigan based offshoot of the largest Nazi movement in America, the National Socialist Movement. Uh, he's a he is part of a movement of healing and de-radicalization and in this work went on to create the Team Revelation Mixed Martial Arts Program uh, that util utilizes mixed martial arts to help troubled youth who are entering gang, gangs and extremist cultures. Um, and then our third presenter uh, is Daryl Davis, who many of you know. Daryl Davis is a blues musician uh, and has played with some of the greats in the world, including Muddy Waters and Chuck Berry, something that just causes great awe in, in myself and other uh, music fans. Uh, but Daryl has received acclaim for his book, Clandestine Relationships, uh, and in a documentary called Accidental Courtesy. And in this work, he has brought out hundreds of members of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Daryl has a collection of Klan robes at home, uh, and he's made this work, his work, uh, bringing these people out of the world of hate. He's a recipient of numerous awards, including the MLK Award and the Bridge Builder Award. He's also an actor <laughs> uh, and has a whole life uh, in the entertainment field, including appearing on the TV show, The Wire. Uh, and his story is one of personal connections to people who are in extremism. And I could go on and on about these individuals. They're all remarkable in their own right. But I just wanted to give you a little um, taste of, of what their background is so we can hear from them. Um, and so we'll start with, with Gary, with Dr. Slutkin. If you could uh, share with us uh, your, your piece of this uh, understanding of extremist violence and how we can actually put that to work. And I'll just turn it over to you. Yeah. Um, uh, great. Thanks uh, for the uh, wonderful introduction, Judy. Um, thanks for hosting this. And Randy, it's amazing to be with you as well as with uh, Daryl and Ryan. Uh, so um, in this short period uh, for now, what I'm going to be doing is explaining um, the way that we see violence and the way that we understand violence and how violence works and what that means to um, how to um, not only look at it, but interact with it differently than the ways that we've thought before, how that tracks into what we have been doing and what this project does. And then as time permits to begin to talk about um, the issue of genocide, which is just an extension of this extremely terrible disease to which Randy has described some of what he's seen recently. So as mentioned, I'm a, a physician epidemiologist, so I come from the world of infectious diseases. Um, violence is an infectious disease. It is, um, and this is not a metaphor, it meets all of the criteria and definitions of disease. It's very characteristic signs and symptoms um, causing disabilities and death, just like any other disease. And it's contagious, meaning that um, one event leads to another, and it leads to more, leads to more. And this is how you get waves of violence, just as we're seeing now in Ukraine, or as we're seeing upticks in extremist violence, upticks or outbreaks of violence in communities now, of suicides, and so on. All of these are, <laughs> almost all of them are on the up now. But what I'm telling you in terms of the contagious nature of it is this is why it shows up in this way as waves. How does this work? How does violence work? How is it infectious? It's infectious through brain processes. And what? how does that work? 
it works by exposure and susceptibility, just like COVID. You know, if you're very close to it, like with COVID, where the, there's a lot of it around you, if the people around you have it, just like you're more likely to, as it is, get it. And then, but not everyone who's around it, be it COVID, gets a very serious disease from it. Who gets the serious disease are the people who are susceptible. What is susceptibility for COVID? Well, we've all seen what that is. It's older and having other health problems. For violence, the susceptibility is how you feel about yourself, whether you have grievances, and how much you need to belong and to get be acknowledged and to be given credit and to be given status. This is where bullying comes from. And this is where even violent leaders come from. And this is where joining a gang or a group comes from, is having this exposure and having this susceptibility. And let me just add that this pertains to all forms of violence. They are all syndromes of the same disease, the same horrible disease. Violence in a community, violence in the family spreads to, another, to your next family and then to their next family. Child abuse, war, people who leave war are more likely to do violence in their home and in their community. Even though they're not the enemy, how could they do that? It's because it's contagious. So what do we, now we can see that this is a contagious disease and in fact, the health problem, how do we manage it differently? Well, you'll see examples of that as described by Ryan and Daryl in this project that we're so happy to be um, collaborating with. But our experience in Cure Violence, having now applied this in over a hundred communities in on five different continents in many different places, is that you can get 40 to 70% drops in shootings and killings by treating violence as a contagious disease. What do you do? They'll describe it to you, but essentially it's getting outreach workers and violence interrupters, people from the same group who know their way around, who have trust and access and credibility to interact with the people who might be doing it or who are thinking of doing violence and cooling them down. Now they're not only the right people, but they're trained and skilled in cooling people down, in buying time, and gradually helping them with their needs and changing their perspective so that the violent event doesn't happen. And if any violent event doesn't happen, then the spread doesn't happen. Just like preventing a COVID prevents further episodes of COVID, preventing a violent event prevents further violent events, it being contagious, it having been interrupted. And then, of course, you get into the, the, the end game here, isn't the right phrase really, but a better barrier is the norms. And so that, you know, if everyone's wearing a mask or if everyone's immunized, then you have a norm of a new small behavior that has made a big difference. In, in violence, if you're, you think your friends would disapprove of you, in the norm, for example, some of you may have grown up in the norm, in the neighborhood where a norm is against violence, then you would not even think of doing it. It would be so discouraged rather than encouraged. So these are some of the parameters. This is why the way we see what, what violence is, a contagious disease, um, how it works through um, spreading through these, and we even know the brain pathways, which I don't have time to go through, social approval, social disapproval, and trauma, and how that accelerates things. And now I wanna just go into, um, in the very few remaining minutes, into what Randy was asking about, is where does genocide fit into this? Genocide, of course, is, the intentional deliberate killing of very large numbers of people with the aim of destroying that people or nation or group. 
And so how do you go from one of these to the other? And it's a gradual, although it could be a fast process, just like the genocide in Rwanda, which was 800,000 people in only three months. How does that happen? It's because sometimes violence spreads like cholera, like really fast. And so and what is the backdrop for that? Well, now you're talking not just about individual, but you're talking about group behavior. And in some cases, as, we, as we've seen historically, state behavior, nation behavior, which we um, people are saying, and we may be seeing, and I think we are seeing, the behavior in Eastern Europe now, which of course is, does not come out of nowhere, but it comes along with a whole bunch of other collaborating symptoms. And some of these symptoms are extremely present in American society at this moment and also accelerating. What am I talking about? I'm talking about lies, including very big lies, lies of betrayal, which of course there was a big lie of betrayal of the Germans, you know, after World War I, which many people know about, and that, but it seems not everybody. And that lie did not, that they were betrayed, they didn't really lose. Um, that lie did not simmer down. It grew and grew and grew. The lies, the propaganda, the grievances, the people not doing well, the blaming of others, all of these things we're seeing. And then the gradual, but not so gradual, right in front of your eyes, the marginalization of very specific minority groups. For in some cases, gays, Jews, Muslims, whatever, and um, even women. So this is hierarchy and it's gradual allowing of, let's say voting rights in blacks, let's say abortion rights in women, let's say don't say gay, the ability to go to develop a myth of the past that, we're, that we would go back to, for example, making a country great again. These are all, this is all a playbook on the way to authoritarian and violent society. So although I'm out of time, there will be questions, but one of the most important things here is to see that all of these things that I've named are accelerating in an epidemic form. They all lead to something in a very characteristic playbook. And when you see the pathogenesis, the development of a disease in a person, let's say the beginning of plague or TB or COVID, and then it gets worse and worse, you can see the development of a disease in a society also, which likewise needs to get interrupted, not within its symptoms, but also to get the diagnosis right. The diagnosis in the case of violence itself, and the diagnosis in this case, in the way a state is developing. And what we're seeing clearly here now in the disease language, which I think is accurate, is a relapse of 20th century Europe, a relapse, a relapse. And why do I say that? Because it has all the symptoms of the same disease. So all of these things need to be in our, it needs to be named right, a lot of public education, a lot of interruption, and we're way behind. So I'll stop, I'll stop there to be in the time yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gary, for framing that way and giving us that sort of health frame to put this in and, and connecting it to, to our current climate. I, I really appreciate how that makes sense, how we can take those two worlds and put them together. Um, we're going to next hear from Ryan Lowry from Parallel Networks. Ryan, floor is yours. I want to thank World Oregon and the <clears throat> Oregon Jewish Museum for having us today. And um, it's wonderful to be here with all of our speakers. Um, Daryl Davis, you often hear me say he's my brother from another mother, or he'll hear him say it. 
Um, and, and Randall, I get to work with you uh, pretty much on a daily basis, which is, is an honor in itself. Um, Gary, I, you know, I got to meet you recently and your work and what we're seeing it play out itself here in Oregon um, is it, just great to see this health model and it's important in today's world. And, and I'm kind of going to get into that with what I talk about here myself. Um, you heard Randall talk about that I used to be a former extremist. I de-radicalized almost 20 years ago um, from a, a neo-Nazi skinhead group that was in Flint. Uh, used to be called the Buick City Boot Boys, and we had rebranded as the Rollingwood Skins eventually uh, to try to walk away from some murders that had been committed by the group pr prior to me um, coming in. Um, the thing I want to point out the importance of this today is, is what helped me to de-radicalize and what's helped so many others and what we failed on previous to this. So a lot of people will look at what has happened with the war on terror in the United States and abroad. And we could easily tell you that we failed the war on terror. Why? Because you heard Randall talk about this in the beginning is that so many people have thought that, you know, the lock, up, lock them up, throw away the key method was going to work. And really what it doesn't, when you look at other countries, maybe in some European areas that have recidivism rates right around the 20 some percent, but then you look at America where we sit around a 70 some percent recidivism rate, well, what, what are we doing wrong? Well, what's happening is, is we get locked up and we, we go right back to those same groups again. You start to subgroup yourselves and you radicalize even further. Um, sometimes you, you come back out, you know, after you've got a prison, if there's no program to help you de-radicalize or to help to pull you away from those groups, what do you do? You go back to those same groups again. And that's what we see continuously happening in the United States when it comes to this and, and abroad in some areas that think that locking them, locking them up without looking at other things is the answer. Um, it took me a long time to understand what was happening with myself internally so that I could help other people. And I realized that I had like violence being very addictive. It's, it's very true. I lived a life of a lot of trauma. I was abused as a young man and understand I'm not saying this to get sympathy from anybody, but I want you to understand how violence can be very addictive. I, I was abused as a young man, sexually and physically from my father, my uncle who molested me at uh, between about the ages of three and five. Um, and it eventually had led me into my teenage years where I decided to rebel against my parents. And I committed a lot of violent acts, a lot of fighting, um, and, and other things that I would do just to think that I was having fun because I was addicted to that life. Um, eventually I was locked up in a boys school where he did a lot of fighting. And then I joined the military out of that boys school um, where I received more trauma. And you know, I never really stopped to heal and see all the things that I had faced and faced those things you know, with the proper type of treatments um, because it was this continuous thing in life. I was just doing what my uncle and my father and everybody else had always done and that was violence. Um, you know, it, it, what, what, what took me into a different route, and you'll hear us talk about credible messengers in this uh, project that we have here, was uh, there was a few different people that really helped to kind of change my route. You hear me talk about my sentencing judge. You hear me talk about the attorney general of the state of Michigan right now, Dana Nessel. And you'll hear me talk about uh, my cellmate at the time while I was actually incarcerated. So... I, I eventually get incarcerated for some of the crimes that we were committing while I was actually part of this group. And while I was incarcerated, um, I was actually eventually, I was jumped and I was beaten while I was in, in jail. And one of my cellmates, a black man, was the only man that actually came to my aid. And not only did he come to my aid though, he told me that he didn't believe the things that I had done were truly me. He believed that those were things that were learned and those were things that could be changed. And that I just needed more education. I needed to open myself up more to the world. So I need to stop being so narrow-minded. You know, and at that time, I'm like, oh, you're crazy, you're crazy, you know. But eventually, those things did click. When the same person that sentenced me, this judge that sentenced me, Judge Farah, who was a Jewish man, said that I don't believe this is you either. I believe that you have a much larger purpose. And he, and I had never heard that before. You know, most men in my life, I had always heard that you're going to amount to nothing. You're going to be nothing in this world. So in my head, I had always said, what am I going to amount to? What's the point in trying to be anything good in this world? If that's all I'm ever going to be is, is nothing to my, to my family members. Uh, but, he, but he believed in me. He gave me purpose. Um, he introduced me to his family. Um, he took me into the community and, and showed me places that I had never saw before. And because of that, I started to 
to believe in myself again. I started to believe that maybe I could really be change and make change in the community. Um, understand that my radicalization didn't happen overnight. There was a lot of therapy, a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists that had different work that I had to things I had to face and realize that a lot of the hate that I had for the world was hate that I had held from against myself. It was this, this self-hate that I was, you know, putting out to the rest of the world. And through my healing, I started to be able to let go of those things and face those things. And um, eventually got to the point where I was introduced to an organization that was really, really big about storytelling, narrative storytelling, and the importance of people like credible messengers like myself and what we can do to change our communities. Um, for a long time, I hid from my story. I didn't want to tell anybody that I had been a neo-Nazi at some point in time in my life. I didn't take the kids to the beach because I had a swastika tattoo on my arm for a long time. Um, but once I realized the importance of how much it could change, once I sat down with Holocaust victims, once I sat down with people that had actually been through a genocide, I realized the importance of their stories to me and why my story was so important to get out there and tell. Um, eventually, I was, I was supported and, and publicly supported and, and loved and still a great friend to this day by our Attorney General, Dana Nessel, who is another Jewish woman who loves me to death. I support her in her election. She's getting ready to run here again for office. And, you know, it's in her support and people like her that have allowed me in, in, in to believe in myself and to continue to push to make that change. Um, this is very, very important. We talk about empathy and love and understanding and us as humans realizing that all of these things are human behaviors and they're learned behaviors. And if we can educate our communities and get to these people before they decide to make that radical change towards violence, then that is so important. And that's how we stop disease from spreading is by having something that can stop it from spreading. And I won't get so much into the science, I'll leave that for, for Dr. Gary, but um, it, it is it works with credible messengers. We've seen it work through interventions that I've done um, with work with parallel networks. We see this in some of our recidivism projects that we have with parallel networks. And now we see this happening with the project that we have with Cure Violence Global in Portland, where we, we believe that by getting to people before they decide to make that radical change or having people that have the entrance to those parts of society, um, they can get into these communities and tell them that enough is enough. We don't need the violence. Is that really the best route? You know, we're not here to change the perception of reality per se, but is violence really the answer? And, um, and, and, and educate them so that it doesn't go um, further into something, um, you know, catastrophic or eventually like we talk about lead to something like genocide. Um, you know, we, we look back at World War II in history and most of the people that were drawn into the genocide in Germany there um, probably never imagined what would eventually happen um, um, with the Jewish community there. Um, but it did happen. And that was because those were everyday normal Germans living in life, but were drawn into something so horrific. And those things can happen today. We see that with authoritarianism on the rise, not just in America, but abroad in a lot of different countries. And I think that's why it's important to have educational panels like this and have organizations like ours they're out here doing the work that we do to try to prevent something like that from happening in the future. So I'm not gonna hold up the time too much more. I think our next speaker, you are all going to really, really enjoy. Daryl always is um, a blessing to have on this planet. And I'm so happy to hear him every single time he talks. So Daryl. Uh, yeah, thanks you know, Ryan. <laughs> thanks Ryan. Yeah, you're, I mean, Ryan, I mean, I have to say that your story is very powerful. It is a story of you know, rises and falls, but but ultimately redemption and the, and the work that you're doing. I mean, we live in a city where it's very easy to to hate uh, neo Nazis, but um, you know, today's neo Nazi is tomorrow's anti racist activist and 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 worker like the work that you're doing. So I would just want to celebrate your story. And speaking of stories, someone who can tell a good story or two is, is our, our final panelist, uh, Daryl Davis, who I introduced earlier, who has utilized uh, the stories of his encounters with white supremacists to talk about this issue of redemption. So Daryl, the floor is yours. Thank you, Randy. And, and thank you for that great introduction and to Judy and World Oregon for, for bringing us all together. And my family has expanded. I, I have, uh, I have uh, three new brothers in addition to, uh, or two new brothers in addition to Randy. I got Gary and I got Randall. So welcome to the family, gentlemen. So yeah, well, 
you know, I, I want to I want to say I agree with everything everybody has said, starting with uh, with Randall, that you know there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation going around out there that affects how people behave, how they think, and how they act towards one another. Uh, and what what Dr. Gary said is also true. You know that this violence is indeed an infectious, contagious disease. It spreads. It spreads like, like any other contagious disease. But before the violence comes another infectious, contagious disease, also known as anti-Semitism and racism. Those two are infectious, contagious diseases that often, if not treated, will escalate and lead to that violence. And this comes from being around in what we call today bubbles or echo chambers, where we're constantly being fed that, that information while we surround ourselves with people who believe as we do, and it reinforces what we believe. So that happens. And also what uh, Ryan Lurie said, education is what is needed. Let me tell you something. I have been to 61 countries on six continents. I've been to all 50 states. All that is to say that I have been exposed to a multitude of skin colors, religions, uh, ideologies, sexual preferences, belief systems, you name it, I've seen it. A lot of that has helped shape who I've become. And all this travel does not, does not make me a better human being than someone else. But what it, it makes me, it gives me a better perspective on humanity, if you will, having been exposed to all these kinds of different people and different belief systems, et cetera. What I have concluded is this, no matter how far I've gone from my own country, as close as Canada or Mexico or halfway around the globe, no matter how different the people that I have encountered may be, they don't look like me, they don't speak my language, they don't worship as I do or whatnot, I've always concluded that we all are human beings. And as such, we all want these five basic core values in our lives. Everyone wants to be loved. We all want to be respected. We all want to be heard. We all have something to say. We want to be heard. We all want to be treated fairly. And we all want the same things for our family as anybody else wants for their family. We want to succeed. And if we can learn to apply those five core values or any of them, when we find ourselves in an adversarial situation or in a culture or society, in which we are unfamiliar, I can guarantee the navigation will be much more positive and much more smooth. And what happens is this, with that echo chamber, and like Ryan said, education, okay? And like Gary said, um, the, the infection, the, the uh, contagious uh, disease, how it spreads, and what Randall said about misinformation in that echo chamber. Ignorance, ignorance leads to fear. We fear those things of which we are ignorant. If we do not address that fear, that fear in turn will escalate into hatred because we hate the things that frighten us. If we do not address that hatred, that in turn will escalate into anger, which evolves into destruction. We wanna destroy the things that make us angry that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. But guess what? At the end of the day, they may have been harmless and we were simply ignorant. So now I think that we spend way too much time talking about the other person, talking at the other person, talking past the other person. Why don't we spend just a little bit of time talking with the other person? This is where the education comes in. Another thing we do is this, we start at the top where everything has escalated, all right? At the, at the destruction, the violence. I say, let's not, I mean, while, while that's important, let's put that aside for a second. Let's not start by addressing the destruction. Let's not start by addressing the hatred. Let's not start by addressing the fear. Folks, those are byproducts. Those are symptoms of the root cause, the symptoms of the disease, all right? I mean, not the, the symptoms of the cause of the disease. The disease is the ignorance, all right? If we can cure the ignorance, 
then there's nothing to fear. With nothing to fear, there's nothing to hate. With nothing to hate, there's nothing to get mad about and destroy and get all violent about. The good thing is this, there is a cure for ignorance. That cure is called, as Ryan put it, education and exposure. When you expose people to the truth, when you provide the education that they are lacking, then you have cured the ignorance. And those other byproducts and symptoms tend to fall by the wayside. I think uh, uh, Dr. Gary will tell you, I'm not a doctor, but I, but I know a little bit, that you know, if you have a wart and you have warts on your body, there is one key wart. You, know, you can be cutting off warts all day long, but if you cut off that key wart, all the other warts will fall aside because it, that, 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 that nucleus wart is the one that is spreading and causing all these other warts. It's like cutting off the head of the snake, right? Instead of cutting off the tail. So this is what we need to do. We need to concentrate our efforts, our finances, our time, our energy into the root cause, not the symptoms, the ignorance. Yes, the violence and destruction must be stopped. Yes, it must be addressed. But if we become proactive and go after the ignorance and not reactive and go after the violence, we can prevent a lot of those things that are coming. Now, another thing that we see happening in this country that a lot of people are not talking about is the year 2042. And white supremacists and extremists know it all too well. That is the year, only two decades from now, when this country will become 50-50 population-wise between white and non-white. Our, our country, was built on a two-tier society, white supremacy at the top and slavery at the bottom. As we progress through the decades, we progress like this, perhaps like this, but never like this. And in, since I was born in 1958, when the black population was 12% and the white population was around 86%, today in 2022, the white population is 59%. So this is happening. And this is of great concern to white supremacists and extremists. That's why we're hearing things like, take our country back, make America great again. Okay, things like that are, are dog whistles to people who wanna go back to that time. And these are things that we need to be aware of. That is also what the Capitol insurrection was all about. When you see somebody walking through the Capitol Rotunda carrying a Confederate battle flag and wearing a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt, you don't have to ask them what they want. You already know. They want to go back to that time. And you look at the people. Now, not everybody who was there uh, were violent. Okay, there were tens of thousands of people. The people who entered the Capitol were definitely violent. Not everybody there was violent. Perhaps not everybody there was a racist, but those people who showed you what they want, they want to go back to that time. Take our country back was originally a Klan slogan from 1954 when Brown versus the Board of Education desegregated schools. You can find footage of all kinds of Klan rallies with the Klan leader in front of a microphone and a burning cross behind him saying, we're going to take our country back. I'm not letting my little white boys and girls go to school with little N-words. We're going to take our country back, meaning back to segregation. All right. That slogan evolved again in 2009 when a new political party uh, was born, known as the Tea Party. Their slogan was take our country back. All right. I questioned them. I asked, why are you using a Klan slogan? You know, uh, they said, no, 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 no. What, what we mean is we're going to take our country back from the Democrats, take it back to Republican rule. I said, OK, why don't you say that? Why don't you close it off rather than leave it open ended for misinterpretation? Well, that's what we mean, sir. I said, OK, but the problem I have is this. Um, Jimmy Carter was a Democrat. Bill Clinton was a Democrat. Where was take our country back then? OK, now you've got a black guy in the White House in 2009 and you're screaming, take our country back. What am I supposed to think? Well, sir, that's what we mean. What am I supposed to think when I hear make America great again? Any one of us who's going to run for president is going to say, I'm going to make America great. Any one of us is going to say, I'm going to make America greater than it's ever been. But who's going to say make America great again? These are dog whistles, folk. folks. Don't let it fall on deaf ears. This is why we need to address the misinformation and the disease 
treat it at its core, at its root. So with that going on, I will leave it open to questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Daryl. Thank you so much. We've got some good questions coming in on the q and I'm gonna take the prerogative of being moderator to ask the first one, which is uh, two weeks ago today, I was standing, literally standing in the gas chamber at Auschwitz. And one of the stark realizations was it was rank and file Germans who were doing the killing. It wasn't Hitler, it wasn't Himmler. They were all in a bunker, bunker in Berlin somewhere. It was, you know, average, average people. In a similar way, uh, when you see the news coming out of Ukraine, it is not Putin, but, but Russian soldiers in Bucha and Maripol who are doing these atrocities um, that we see normal, normal, as normal as we can be, people who are caught up in the fervor of hate that becomes genocidal violence. And I, in this model that we're talking about, this personal model, um, how, 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 how uh, vulnerable are people in general? It's like, you know, we talk about how vulnerable we are to the Delta variant and then how even more Delta we are to the Omicron variant. How vulnerable do you see people uh, falling into this mindset? And there was a, a similar question that popped up on the Q&A that asked Daryl to elaborate on the, the goal of talking to the other uh, as, as an important part of you know, engaging people who are different from us. And I, I just, if we, we could get just a brief reflection on the vulnerability that we have to this illness that becomes so egregious to become what we saw 80 years ago at Auschwitz or what we're seeing right now in Maripol? Well, what we saw one year ago in a few months on January 6th is exactly what you're talking about. Right before they marched down to the Capitol, uh, our president, Donald Trump, came out and gave a little short lecture. And what did he say? He said, you cannot take, we, well, we cannot take our country back with weakness. We must show strength. That again was a dog whistle. They marched down to the Capitol and they destroyed it. They destroyed, attempted to destroy our, our democracy and overturn an election, essentially an insurrection. So words have powerful meaning. And just like you pointed out, it wasn't Donald Trump doing it. It's, it's not uh, Vladimir Putin doing it. It's the people that they dog whistle to. And that's what needs to be addressed. Randy, can I add to that? The um, so the, yeah, what what Daryl is saying, and just to with that same example, I mean, here's a um, a church going, you know, rural woman who um, just went down there to find out what was going on. Um, her husband was going to also just see what was going on, and now she's fa um, facing felony charges for attacking the police officer in, in J the January 6th crowd. And so, you know, you get swept up in, in crowds, but the, the vulnerability, the susceptibility to, um, what, what is the vulnerability and susceptibility to COVID? You know, it's, it's the, social pr the social pressure to not wear a mask, the social, the power of social pressure is so incredibly strong that it's, it's very hard to resist. And so what is, what's most relevant here is to what, for example, this program is doing, this project is doing, and the way that the epidemic control model works and cure violence uh, uh, works is that you need someone within these crowds to cool people down. Because your mind is not as strong as you think it can be. Similarly, even within government, similarly in so many situations within protests, within um, at the, and we all need to understand contagion because we show up in the subway or in Starbucks or in Walmart or on where there are things that are happening that if you can see it as contagious, then you yourself could step back rather than as we might have been joining in and making something worse because somebody makes us mad. So this whole, this revolutionary idea is seeing this as contagious 
and seeing that you yourself can be infectious, infected at any moment allows you to now say, I'm stepping back from this contagious disease. And at the same time, allows the system to now have a number of interrupters. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Ryan, do you have a, a take on, on how susceptible we are to this? I'll unmute myself there. Um, I mean, I think as a society, we, we see this with um, so many different things you could look at as a, a kind of a project or, or research that we could see happening in front of us every single day is you, you look at social media. And um, but for instance, let's just use this as an example, what just happened with Will Smith and, and Jada Pinkett and you had, and, and Chris Rock. And you know, the next day you had the nation that you, nobody was talking about what was happening in Ukraine anymore. Every single person in America, I mean, some of us may have been that are in this field, but many of what you saw on social media and other areas was all about what had happened at the Oscars and, and surrounded around that. And so quickly we forgot that there was genocides happening in so many other places. And so it goes to show you as human beings just how vulnerable we are to just about anything. And so when you put somebody like Daryl said in a position of power where we're not used to having a president in the United States that gets up there and says, stand back and stand by to the Proud Boys or makes comments about um, you know, getting people to come down uh, uh, to the Capitol buildings on you know, January 6th. And so it's one thing to hear this from, you know, your you know, a family member or a friend in your community. It's another thing to hear your leaders say it's okay. And, and, and then they follow along kind of like a, a Peter Piper type thing, you know, where it's, it's okay to do if they, my leader said it's okay to do, then we can get away with doing it or out of fear, which a lot of authoritarians like to use is that, um, you know, if you don't do this, then you'll, you'll see some type of consequences, you know, Trump's, doesn't have that full authoritarian power when he was in, but he would use fear and tactics that, you know, the, the migrants are going to come across the border and steal all your jobs and kill your family members. And, you know, you get this fear of all these different things that could happen. But, but basically it just shows you how vulnerable we are as a society when it's so easy to make people forget about a genocide that's happening right now in real time in Ukraine by something as simple as a smack in the face at the Oscars. Um, and then, and then it also goes to show you just how violence um, can be passed down. I, I was surprised to see how many people were okay with the fact that Will Smith had went up and smacked Chris Rock and said that they probably would have done more. So it shows you that his slap went off to show other people that it was okay and more people thought that you should be doing it. And so we, we are, we're very vulnerable as a society to all of these things. And that's why projects like ours and the work that we're all doing is so important. Thanks for that, Ryan. I have to say, we were actually talking about Will Smith in Poland that, at that time, too. It made it all the way to the other side right. of the planet. Right. Um, the first couple of questions came in were for, uh, specifically for uh, Dr. Slutkin, and I'll, I'll ask them together. One, it, just real briefly, if the, you think that there is a genetic element to violence, can violence be transmitted through our, through our genes? And the other was asking for the need uh, for a new national narrative that counters the traditional toughness, nationalist strike first posture. This person asks, does it already exist or does it just need highlighting in terms of how we talk about these things on, the, on, a, on a national level? You know, for the genetic, I'm gonna do fast work of that. Generally speaking, no, unless it's um, uh, the Y chromosome, essentially maleness, um, which may be cultural, which may not even be that. Um, but on the narrative, this, this is such a great question because it, it really, it, it dots back to what Daryl was talking about. And I don't think, know that everybody understands what ignorance really means. I, I understood, I learned this at World Health, the difference between, for example, ignorance and stupidity. Ignorance is really just not understanding something. It doesn't mean anything about intelligence. So a lot of people would not understand an epidemic. They would think that you could get rid of AIDS by eating off of uh, something from a fruit from this tree or something like that. Similarly, you saw a lot of ignorance, um, you know, accelerated by disinformation during COVID. 
but what what you need in, in an epidemic process or in, in anything that is it to be understood very, very simply as to what's going on. So for COVID, we really need to understand that it can be in the air invisibly, and that's why you wear a mask. It's airborne. That's the essence of what needed to be known. And now we have a phenomenon of uh, a basic authoritarian playbook in plain sight. And we, and we, we need to have part of the narrative. So on media, they're talking about the abortion laws or the don't say gay laws or the, let, or the uh, gerrymandering laws. But it, it needs to be in the, in the frame, in the narrative. We need to expose the frame of an authoritarian playbook being played out. And that we have to remove the ignorance of that. And then, you know, what I think Daryl um, was also um, explaining and what Ryan was explaining is like for, you know, if we were to re-understand Will Smith, for example, and ask the question, well, what was his background with? Did he have violence in his background? Then we would stop um, just, and, you know, how much was he helped before then? Why wasn't there an interrupter at the table? Someone who could just put their hand on him, even his wife, and say, where are you going? What are you doing? And then everyone worrying about, you know, whether there's going to be spread and how to talk to your kids about this. Same thing for Ukraine. So the, removing the ignorance. And so part of what we might call narrative is putting the new narrative as to, as to what violence really is, a contagious disease, but also, you know, allowing us to then have a different set of of responses because of that. And then the other thing, you know, picking up, picking up on what Daryl said is, we, all, we only have this, this narrative of race. We don't have a uniformity or a multicultural, beautiful narrative. We don't have that narrative. You know, I, my dad, my parents took me to the, the UN when I was nine, and I just thought it was such a beautiful idea of all of these cultures doing stuff. And I've hit forever had a UN flag on. And I think that I've always thought that the US was the country that was the UN. Because we have, we should care about Israel and Palestine because we have Jewish people and Palestinian people in our country. So we should be the neutral country. We should be exceptional in that way. That's the real promise of America to having all this, all these great people who have all these great skills and all these great points of view. So I don't know if that's it, it's been it for me. I mean, that's why I went on and worked for the UN for World Health and things like this. But the, I don't know if, if we can get to that or whether that's even right, it just worked for me. Yeah, thank you for that. If, if, I, if I can, uh, Randy, if I can uh, expand upon the ignorance and stupidity, absolutely. To, you know, for me, you know, they're, they're two different things, even though a lot of people view them as, as synonymous. But to me, ignorance is somebody who makes a bad choice or the wrong decision because he or she does not have the facts or the proper information, whereby a stupid person is someone who has the facts, who has the proper information, and yet they still make the wrong choice or bad decision. For example, if I, if I paint a room and all the walls are wet and I don't post any signs saying wet paint, stay off the walls, People walking into that room may be ignorant, not in the derogatory sense, but in the unaware sense. And they go and lean against the wall and now they got paint on their clothes. I can cure that ignorance by providing the education. I can post signs that say, wet paint, stay off the walls. I can stand in the doorway telling each person who enters that room, hey folks, gather around the center. These walls are wet, you know, so gather around the center. So now everybody has the proper information. They have the facts to make the right choice. But yet somebody who has those facts still comes in and leans against the wall. And now he wants to know why is there paint on his clothes? It's because he's stupid, okay? Fortunately, there is a cure for ignorance. That's education and exposure. Unfortunately, there is no cure for stupidity. And that's the work we do in education. We're, we're almost out of time and there's, a, there's a, a bunch of good questions, but there's one that's really profound that I would love to be able to get some quick feedback on because I don't know how I would answer this question. And the question is, uh, how is de-radicalizing societies or groups of people different or the same as de-radicalizing individuals? It's such a good question because 
you know, we're focused on a very micro level process of de-radicalization, but we also, we want to talk about, you know, some of these larger systemic issues. So the question is, de is de-radicalizing society different than de-radicalizing individuals? And if you could sort of take a brief stab at it, uh, whoever wants to jump in. I don't mind, but I don't want to go first. If there's... No, you're, you're, I, I can start a little bit on this. It's, you know, I think it's, um, obviously you're taking something from micro and you're having to, to expand it and something that like Parallel Networks has done is, you know, Parallel Networks in its name itself is trying to create a parallel network from what uh, terrorists or extremists create in their self. And so um, we've done this on more of a mass um, group by, you know, doing things like the magazine that we have, El Taqwa, where we were able to put this out to jihadist communities and try to basically uh, do what they do with a lot of counter messaging and counter narrative works where um, you have organizations that are out there doing uh, campaigns like Escape Hate, to where you'll have a guy like my story um, telling you, you know, what happened to me, the fact that I was able to change my life, and then they'll give you a helpline or a hotline at the end that you can call or if you need to reach out to somebody for help. It's all of these types of tools, and we can go into, you know, multiple different ones that are being used that go to, to more than just an individual level, but sometimes, you know, a, a, a group level too. Um, now, as a, a, I don't know if I, if I feel comfortable answering, like, how do you do like a whole country per se, you know, when you've got a leader like Putin doing what he's doing, that's a, that's a much harder um, idea that I think many of us all need to come together and, and try to figure out. But, um, but I definitely think those tools that we are using do work on a, on a, a bigger scale. We've seen where we've put these types of things out and we've had, you know, not just right-wing extremists, but we've had a lot of different jihadists and people that have reached out from the same groups that it, just like violence can be contagious, positivity and uplifting and saying that you can change can be very contagious to those groups too. And so we start to draw more of them out, but I'll, I'll leave the rest of it up to Dr. Gary. Well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw up my two cents and then, and then let, uh, let, let Gary take, take us, take us, take us uh, home on it. Cause I know he has, he has a better answer than I do. But yes, I think, you know, de-radicalizing individuals and de-radicalizing a society can be one and the same, but yet it can be different. Uh, for example, uh, Ryan became de-radicalized. All right, he's an individual. But in turn, Ryan now has children. I believe he has six children or something, okay? Those children are not gonna follow in his footsteps. They are gonna make a better society. They're gonna be people in our society. So in a sense, de-radicalizing Ryan is de-radicalizing society. Now, in terms of like say systemic uh, is issues, uh, like racism, for example, uh, when Martin Luther King did the bus boycott with Rosa Parks in, uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, the laws were changed after a year of boycotting the bus system. The laws were changed the day the laws were changed that allowed black people to sit wherever they wanted to sit in the bus did not necessarily change the attitudes of the white riders that day. But over time, because the laws changed, the law can compel behavior. It may not change feelings, but it can, it can compel behavior. While, while it was legal to arrest Rosa Parks at one time, now it's, it's uh, legal to arrest somebody who tries to make Rosa Parks get out of the seat. All right. So over time, those laws will cause society to, to de-radicalize because people become accustomed to, to, to repetitive action. Gary, it's all yours. I mean, be, behavior change to scale, to community level, to um, country level, and to global scale level is the way that the, the major accomplishments of humankind have been made. This includes the eradication of smallpox, ch children now living instead of half of them dying before age five, diarrheal diseases going um, away. And um, that's, it's done through norm change. It, I mean, there, law change is great and norm change is the other way. And it's um, in this case, and this is the way cure violence works. It, it gets 30, or it gets 40 to 70% drop in shootings and killings, pretty tough behavior in um, the usual community. It works in there's 13 communities that have gone to having zero um, shootings and killings that were very dangerous. So be behavior change of scale is, is the way that this methodology 
um, works. And part of it is the interruption of things that might spread. And part of it is shifting what people now perceive to be normal and acceptable in what is not acceptable. I mean, right now we're not smoking in public places where before we all were. I mean, there, there was the, the amount of HIV in Uganda went down 85% with before there were drugs and before, and there's still no vaccine because the sexual behaviors, which is a much harder behavior to change than violent behavior, it's way much harder. So it's, it's a matter of shifting the norms through the narratives, through public education done in, in a very, very large scale way. And it's through interrupting the, um, become, the outlier events. Read, in terms of specifically, radicalization and de-radicalization. I'm not concerned about radicalization. I'm concerned about the violence. In fact, you know, as I'm a Jewish person, I may or may not care how much people like me, but I don't want violence done. And I think that, and not everybody's gonna like everybody else, but I think that we need to just respect each other's rights and not do um, uh, violence. And I think that's the way out is really to completely disapprove of, not only by friends, but by all of society universally to push back on any violence. And I think we're seeing somewhat of a global feeling about that without knowing exactly all the ways to do with respect to um, the, the relapse in Eastern Europe now. Seems to be that there's a tremendous um, response against it and people are not happy to be, they're very, very distressed by it rather than accepting it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point to end up on. I mean, the, the amount of outpouring of public support I saw in Poland while I was there, people r rushing into the burning building to help people was, was a cause of great optimism of changing norms on a global level. So I appreciate that. I want to say we're, we're over time. Surprise, surprise. I want to thank our panelists. This conversation could go on and on. I want to encourage people if they want to engage in our project to go to pure, uh, cure-pdx.org and you can sign up to be on our mailing list. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for this wonderful conversation. We've got Tim DeRoche from World Oregon here that's going to close us out. Tim? Great. Thank you, uh, Randy. Um, uh, my name is Tim DeRoche. I am the director of programs for World Oregon. I want to thank um, Randall Blazak, Daryl Davis, Ryan Lurie, Larry Slutkin, and our dear friends and community partners at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, as well as all of you who joined us with your great questions for such an important and really, really rich conversation. We know the world is more connected than ever. At the same time, fear, hate, and misunderstanding are continuing to bring and cause harm around the globe and here at home. So joining us today is hopefully um, hopefully you believe as we do that the deeper global understanding and the ability to engage in difficult conversations are essential to a more peaceful world and programs like today are vital in moving us toward that vision. So thank you. One note that this program is being recorded for later viewing on YouTube. So please share across your communities and networks. Also, please take care of one another and we hope to see all of you in this town square that we share very, very soon. Thanks. Thank you everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.